Um, over the course of my lifetime, God has taught me, I think, a great many things. And one of the things that he's taught me that I've been too reluctant to share is how to deal with being human and how to deal with the pain that is all too often a part of our everyday lived reality. He's taught me a lot there, and I want to try and share some of that with you. Back when I was in the seminary, oh, about halfway through, I got to a place in my life where I was full of doubt and full of despair and really questioning my vocation, questioning whether or not I was really called to this. And um, I was just in this, for months, constant state of turmoil. Uh, to the point where it, it really got to me, affected everything that I was doing. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. Um, and it got to the point where finally I went to my superior and I said, um, either I get some help or I take a leave of absence and, and sort this out. And uh, for luckily on my behalf, he said, well, we'll get you the help. And he hooked me up with a counselor, a friend of his uh, in Washington, D.C. that he knew very well. Really good man, very dedicated Catholic layman who worked a lot with priests and seminarians and because he understood I think some of the things that uh, that we go through and he was um, of immense help to me and gave me and taught me a lot of things that I've been able to keep with me uh, to help um, guide and, and direct my life the thing that he taught me first and foremost was that we're all human and we're all weak and we all have in one way or another some measure of pain within our lives. And what he taught me to do was to, rather than run from that pain, to run to it, to embrace it, and to find in it God working his work in me, God transforming me into who and what he wants me to be. And as a part of that process, he. Um, also had me read uh, a wonderful, wonderful book by the late uh, Omri Nowen called The Wounded Healer. And if you haven't read it yet, I suggest that it ought to be required reading for anyone who wants to be a Christian. Uh, because what he talks about in there is how, again, from that place of pain that all of us have, we can find God in that pain, in the depths of our misery, in the depths of our despair, and we can find him leading us through that and transforming us into who and what he wants us to be. I'm not here before you today to tell you that I've been successful at that, uh, but it has been very much a guiding principle uh, throughout my life. Jesus himself is the perfect example of the wounded healer. And today's gospel really demonstrates that in, I think, a very powerful and profound way. One of the major themes that runs through Luke's Gospel is this journey that Jesus takes to Jerusalem. At one point early in the Gospel, it says that Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. And the implication there is that he was determined in his own mind that he was going to do this. He was going to make this journey knowing full well, knowing full well what awaited him there. Knowing that the cross awaited him there noting that the, that the depths of despair and misery was waiting for him there in Jerusalem, but he set his face and decided to make that journey anyway. And throughout a good, good part of the Gospel of Luke, it's all about that journey to Jerusalem and how, as he has his disciples and apostles with him, he begins to instruct them and tries to give them insight into his own self-realization as to who and what he is and what the purpose of his life and therefore their lives is all about. And in today's passage, that journey is over. He rounds the bend, and there he sees Jerusalem laid out before him, and he stops and has a good cry. And he weeps, not for himself, not for what awaits him in Jerusalem, and he knows what awaits him, but rather he weeps for Jerusalem. He weeps because of their inability to understand and the grasp the fullness of who and what he is. He weeps because of the cross that awaits them. And then goes and cleanses the temple. 
what you need to understand is that in that passage, in the Greek that's being used, when they talk about him weeping, it's not a strong enough word. What the, what the actual text implies is that this was a cry of anguish, a cry of incredible despair. He was hurting over what he knew was about to happen, not just to him, but to Jerusalem. He was hurting. And from that place of pain within him, rather than trying to escape that pain, he ran to it. And his cleansing of the temple is a symbol of what his life and purpose and ministry was all about. Because he goes to the temple and he drives out the money changers. Do you know what the money changers were? If you're an adult Jew in Israel, you have to at least once a year pay a temple tax. This was not a tax imposed by the Romans. This was part of the Jewish law. And so it was a tax that most of them agreed to and understood that they had to do. But that, the law and the rule was very specific. You could only pay that tax with shekels. Now in Israel at that time, there were so many diverse nationalities and cultures filtering through there, Romans, Greeks, Egyptians, Alexandrians, whatever, that there was all kinds of currency around, all kinds of currency in use. But if you were going to the temple to pay your temple tax, you had to pay it with a shekel. And so the high priest and his associates set up little booths where money changers would sit and you could give them your Roman coin or your Greek coin or your Egyptian coin or whatever and get its equivalent back in shekels. But it cost you and it cost you dearly because they imposed an incredible fee on that service. And so they were getting very, very wealthy off of changing these coins. He also not only drove them out, but he drove out those who were buying and selling animals. Again, if you're going to the temple to worship, you have to bring with you an animal to sacrifice. Now, animals could be found anywhere. The turtle doves that you need, or the lambs, or whatever it is that you need, they could be found anywhere, and they could be found at a reasonable price. But, again, because the, the Jewish uh, restrictions and the Jewish laws and, and stipulations as to what was to be sacrificed, uh, they were very, very strict and stringent that that animal had to pass an incredibly difficult examination because it had to be an animal without blemish. And the best place to find an animal without blemish was within the temple in the booth set up again by the high priest because they made sure those animals were perfect and ready for the sacrifice. But it cost you dearly because the prices on those animals was incredibly marked up. What was happening there was an incredible exploitation of the poor, exploitation of the weak, exploitation of those who were coming to worship in spirit and truth and were getting ripped off in the process. And out of his place of pain, out of his place of misery, out of his place of despair, Jesus approaches that temple and drives them out and cleanses it to right the wrong that's happening there, to turn it truly into a place of prayer, into a place of worship into a place that was real, where people could, God, could approach God in a real and true way. That's what this was all about. And he couldn't do that unless he came from that place of incredible pain, incredible despair within him, allowing himself to find God within the depths of his being to drive him, to propel him into doing the things he had to do. And the passage ends remarkably saying that he taught daily in the temple, knowing what awaited him, knowing that there was a price on his head, knowing that they were after him, he taught daily in the temple. Again, to demonstrate the reality that he was being propelled to, that he was the new temple, that he was the place where, from now on where God truly resided, and that all worship, on all prayer, needed to be directed at him. He got to that, out of that place of pain within his own life, that pain within the depths of his being, at the core of his very self, that's what brought him to that place. If you can understand that, 
we don't even need to talk about Good Friday, do we? And what his pain propelled him to there. So here we are, his followers, human and as real and as vital as he was, and full of pain, all of us. And we have choices to make. We can learn what I've learned or have tried to learn, and, or we can run from the pain. We can run from, run from it, or we can run to it. And running to it makes all the difference. I've had in my life, as you know, some measure of pain, some measure of despair, things that have happened that I never thought would happen. Um, and I've tried to understand what I've learned and what I've been taught and to use those principles and those guidelines so that I can find my way and become the person that hopefully God wants me to become. And again, not that I'm perfect, not that I've done it, not that I've succeeded, um, but I do feel like I'm on my way. I do feel like I've learned a thing or two and I would try and share those things with you. What's happened to my son has taught me never to take anything for granted and, and to understand that no matter what happens in our lives, no matter how bad it is, God is there in that, in that pain, in that misery, leading us to where he wants us to be. That if we let him, if we give him permission, he can enter into that pain, he can enter into the depths of our humanity and use that to transform us and make us into who he wants us to be. That can happen. That should happen. All of um, Josh's nurses tease me. They call me Mr. Positive because they don't understand how I can have a positive outlook. Uh, I learned, apart from Josh, I learned long ago that your attitude makes the difference in everything. That, you're, that everything depends upon your attitude, how you decide to look at things, how you decide to approach things, how you decide to live life. And an attitude, I've learned, is nothing more than a habit of thought. An attitude is a habit of thought. And like any other habit, it can be formed, it can be molded, it can be shaped, it can be transformed, it can be broken. But your attitude is what makes you, and you choose your attitude through whatever kind of habit of thought you decide to accept in your life. So you choose your attitude, you choose what guides you, you choose what directs you. And what we have to learn, because pain in our lives, because we're human, pain is inescapable. It's a part of our reality, it's a part of who we are, it's a part of what God gives us, and we don't understand it. And we wail and moan and say, why me? Why has this happened to me? And you don't know. But what you have to do, what you have to learn to do, is to descend into that pain, to go to it and accept it, and understand that it's a part of your life for God's reasons, for God's purposes. And trust me, if you do that, you will find him there. You will find him in it, teaching you about himself and teaching you about yourself. If you let that place of pain guide you and transform you, and if you begin, as Christ did, to live from it, to act as you do because of it, then, then you're transformed and everything around you is transformed and you see everything differently. That's the purpose of pain and sorrow and sadness in our lives. We're not supposed to run from it. We're supposed to run to it, as Christ did. And in that, find him in it and find ourselves, our true selves, in it as well. Not easy to do. It's not. But well worth doing. I have, um, the past couple weeks, um, as I've had to deal with nursing shortages and everything else, I've come to a place um, that slowly I'm beginning to accept, especially because of the help of a, a kind and wonderful archbishop. Um, I've been able to understand that these past couple of weeks were really difficult for me. And I understand that uh, the day will come in my life when I will no longer be able to care for Josh the way I do now. And 
that's difficult and hard for me to face. Really difficult. I see you nodding your head, Anita. Um, it's, it's really hard. Um, but I have to face that. And I have to start looking at options and start looking at possibilities. And I have to understand and accept the fact that one of those possibilities, and I hope it isn't, but one of those possibilities may be the reality that Josh will no longer be able to live with me. I have to accept that. I have to deal with that as a possibility. I can run from that pain, as I have been doing, or I can run to it and find God in it. Life is all about our attitudes. It's all about the choices that we make. And pain causes us to make our choices. And so I choose him. Because all too often I have found him in my pain, in my despair, and in my misery. So I choose him because I know he can transform it and make me into who he wants me to be. And I choose you. I choose you because I know that together we can look at our lives and look at the journeys we've been on, look at the pain we've been through, the pain that we're facing, and that together we can find our answers. I choose him because he can make me into who he wants me to be and he can make me into the priest you need me to be. And so I choose you too. So look at your own lives, look at your pain, look at your misery, your despair, whatever it is, and I know it is there. Last time I checked, you were no less human than me, and I'm sure that you have no degree of pain less than me. I don't claim to have a monopoly on it by any means. Look at your life, look at your pain, and decide, will I continue to run from it, or will I run to it? And if together we can face the realities that we need to face, if together we can run to our pain and give God in that permission to mold us and shape us and to form us into who he wants us to be, then together we can cleanse the temple and make it a true home, a true place of prayer, a true place of worship, and find him here loving us and sustaining us in ways that we never thought possible. Don't run from your pain. Run to it and find him there. Amen.